What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bastard of business, a dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're engaged. We like to get scared together. Oh, man. I While I was getting ready for this episode, I just I had that jib jab that we played the other week stuck in my head the entire i still have it stuck in my head which one the um the, this land the is your sure, land will surely vote for me i yeah, forget what episode that was months ago that we played that honey <laughs> time doesn't exist anymore but anyway i'm hoping that doing this i will be distracted finally and get that song out of my as head as soon as we cut i'm gonna start singing no, it no please no but this speaking, land is your no. land. You have more flip flops. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! But speaking of America, <laughs> we're reviewing 2006 as the host. And I know you're. But you, that's a South I Korean know, movie. I know you might be thinking, but that has nothing to do with America. <laughs> but actually, Bong Joon Ho's movie, his monster movie, has a lot to do with America. It is explicitly, not explicitly, he says it's, you know, that's not what it's entirely about, but there are certainly some anti American undertones. And in fact, if you go to the Wikipedia article about anti American sentiment in Korea, it's like a section on the Wikipedia. Really? The host. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Also, for anyone who may be confused, this is not host. Yeah, this is not host that just came out on Shudder. Which is very scary. And this is not the host based on that Stephanie Meyer book with Saoirse Ronan that came out, I don't know, 2010? Okay. 11? Saoirse Ronan doesn't want to remember it either, maybe. Really? <laughs> it's not good. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. This is the host uh, directed by Oscar winner Bong Joon-ho. Yes, who did Parasite. Parasite. Also did Snowpiercer. Mm-hmm. And Okja, dope. which I still haven't watched because I'll just be sad the entire time. Uh, Memories of a Murder, is, I think th- that was right before the host, but really awesome director definitely mission statement to his movies you know yeah. he's got stuff to say about class <laughs> he's got class and commentary going international on. politics especially in this one i i adore his movies um him winning all those oscars this year was like the one really cool thing that happened in 2020 so far god that was 2020 yeah. i guess what february if the academy allows i would like to get a texas chainsaw Split the Oscar trophy into five and share it, share it with all of you. But I thought, so yes, The Host is a monster movie. It's, mm-hmm. it's kind of like a fish <laughs> monster. It's like a fish. It's like a fish lizard salamander. It's like a, he's like stuck in, I don't know why I'm calling it a he, but it's stuck in a stage of evolution. You yeah. know, it looks like he got it, caught mid crawling out it's of the It's a spore ocean. creation. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but I think this movie, you, I really wanted to cover the history that inspired this movie because this was inspired by a few true events, uh, Bong Joon-ho has said, um, including one at the very beginning of the film is a thing that actually happened the U.S. military dumping formaldehyde into the Han River. Oh. That actually happened in the year 2000. I think this movie's so much more interesting if we kind of go through and look at the history and relationship between South Korea and the United States. Um, And I think maybe it'll help explain why this movie seems to really have a bone to pick with the United States. There's Mm. a reason that that resentment is there. And it's not just because of this one incident where we dumped some chemicals into a river. So we're going to start after the end of World War II. We're going to go back a little ways because World War II, it's just it's one Korea still. We just got Korea. Mm-hmm. And Korea basically was a Japanese colony. Uh, Japanese occupied it. And so what happened after World War II is the United States and the Soviet Union went in. The United States uh, kind of took over the south part, booted out the Japanese and said, hey, Korea, we're going to help make you an independent country. 
Soviet Union's up north. They're doing the same thing we're doing down here. Our end goal is to establish you guys as an independent country. When has this ever gone wrong when the, <laughs> the United States shows up at your door and says, we're going to make you a country. <laughs> we're going to give you a cool new government. <laughs> but uh, as we tend to do, the United States didn't really have much of a plan in terms of what we're going to do after we occupy the southern half of Korea. There's not really any explicit. We just think we can kind of show up and fix stuff. And I thought of Iraq, especially when I was reading about this kind of stage of South Korean and American relations, because we kind of showed up in Iraq, too, and there wasn't much of a concrete plan, except they're going to greet us as liberators. It's going to be great. It's all just going to work out. It was kind of the same thing here. It's like, they'll just be so excited we're here that it's all going to go really smoothly. So the U.S. begins to rule. They put military personnel in charge who don't really speak the language or have knowledge of the country. So like we're off to a really good start. That also happened in Iraq, too, which is why. And I, I keep mentioning Iraq because this movie also not so subtly uh, takes some jabs at our involvement in Iraq. Because, yeah, this came out 2006, right? Yes, so right after the Iraq invasion of 2005. Yeah, and this is definitely at the point where... Or was it 2003 that we invaded 2003. Iraq? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. we're definitely at the point where... If you still think Iraq was a good idea, you're probably in the minority by 2006. I think at that point, favorability is has shifted. I, I can't recall the timeline, but yeah. Yeah, probably. I think we're getting into the, oh, this actually was kind of a really dumb idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay, yeah, instead of granting Korea independence, the U.S. just continues to govern instead of, you know, pretty quickly putting Koreans in charge and letting them have their their freed country. The U.S. just continues to hang out and they're no longer greeted as liberators. <laughs> We've outstayed our welcome. And this stokes tensions within Korea's political factions because it's, you know, Korea is not a monolith. You have, you know, just like we do, a giant spectrum of political factions made even more complicated by the fact that now there's this outside <laughs> political faction moving in telling all of them how to run their country and then the cherry on top is now Korea it's essentially two different zones because you have the Soviets in the north and us in the south so there's all these shifts in population and industry ownership and by 1947 there's about 50 percent unemployment wow that's a lot of unemployment that's yeah. actually half. <laughs> and so the U.S. is kind of mishandling things like even reform of the rice collection system, which is catastrophic for urban areas So because there's not farms in the middle of cities. And now there's demonstrations against the United States. So it's openly like people saying we don't want you here anymore. The U.N. finally declares Korea independent and they prepare to have it establish its own government and withdraw occupying forces. But the Soviet Union is not down with that plan and they refuse access to the northern half of Korea. So, oops, we have two Koreas now. And that's how we got North and South Korea. So wait, during World War II, Japan controlled Korea? Yes. It wasn't its own country it was it was a colonized country like korea was its own thing korea, kingdom yeah yeah but it was it was colonized by japan Damn. yeah I so japan essentially history. just runs everything there and that's why you have all these you know rice famine and, and all these um you know unemployment because it's like you just kick everyone out who'd been running everything previously and now you have a bunch of people in charge who don't know how to distribute anything and because there's no plan in place when you just immediately boot out everyone who'd been running the country before what japan yeah, even I feel like they wouldn't have been able to keep running it. No, but I'm saying it's if you do that, but you don't know anything about yeah. how the country operates. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah, yeah. But so now the leaders in South Korea are in a really shitty situation. They either can have independence now because even though the Soviet Union's like, hey, you can't come up here, UN. This is our own thing now. You don't get access. So. Okay, fine. We're just going to scrap the idea of there being a united Korea at this point. So either South Korea can just 
go on ahead with being independent under this agreement with the United Nations. And that comes at the cost of now there are officially two Koreas. Or they can wait for the United States and the Soviet Union to figure their shit out. And like we were just talking, that's not going to happen. The relationship is so fraught. So ultimately, South Korea decides on the former. They decide we're just going to have our independent South Korea now. And in 1948, the Republic of Korea is formed. Is that still its official name, though? Um, North Korea's official name is yeah, the, I've, Dem- the Democratic Republic. I'm not sure Republic if it's officially... Of- Still, that's a good question. The Republic yeah. of Korea, because you know we all just call it South Korea. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, North Korea is definitely still the Democratic People. Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Yeah. Yeah. So that <laughs> is formed less than a month after, also in 1948, under Kim Il Sung, and uh, 1950, North Korea attacks South Korea. So that's the Korean War, yep. the Forgotten War, right, people? For sure. But it's crazy because reading about it. And I, I remember in elementary school, we each got assigned a war to do a presentation about. I got the Korean War. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, it has the coolest memorial in D.C. Yes, it does. That memorial is very yeah. cool. Yeah. Reading about it, it's it's weird that it's the Forgotten War, and it's weird we don't really talk a ton about it because there's still so many ramifications from this war, and it's this battle of political ideologies, and it really sets the stage for the last half of the 1900s in terms of how, you know, like Asia in general functions as like a part of the globe and what its dominant political ideology is over there. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I I just think it's really interesting and it sucks that if you ask most people what the Korean War was, they couldn't tell you. Well, it's also because, you know, uh, at least for my limited looking into it in like high school when I was going through all the wars and looking at them and always being kind of intrigued by how Korea was always forgotten sandwiched between World War II and Vietnam, which are obviously much more focal in uh, our, our history. Mm-hmm. It, it's I felt like it was because we had a goal and then we didn't accomplish it and then nothing changed because like the even the boundary between the two countries didn't change right after all that fighting south korea and the united states signed this mutual defense treaty the u.s and south korea now officially agreed to give each other mutual aid if either one faces an attack and now the united states can keep military in south korea so is is korea one of those wars that never officially ended like the, a, a treaty was never signed between the combatants Oh, between the combatants? I don't think so. Yeah. The Korean War ended with a ceasefire agreement in 1953. However, because a formal peace treaty was never signed, technically the two Koreas are still at war to this day. Like that decision, like still, you know, we have military there and stuff. And yeah, it's nuts. That's why it's like, it's crazy we don't talk about Mm -hmm. the Korean War War more because we're still... (laughs) We're still kind of in it. Yeah, in a weird way we are. So after the Korean War, because of this agreement and this this trust between South Korea and the United States, being anti-American in South Korea is radical. It's pro-Soviet. You're an enemy of the state. I think in a lot of cases it's illegal. <laughs> like, oh my God. You can't, yeah, I don't think, you know, they don't have, like the United States is unique in its freedom of expression. Mm-hmm. Um, we're in the minority, I think, of countries where you can just say whatever the fuck. It's a great thing about us. It's, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> um so but in the ensuing decades and again I'm just kind of this is not going to be the whole podcast like I just want to get some build up to the movie itself but in the ensuing decades there start to be anti-American and pro-democracy protests uh President Park Chung-hee is assassinated I didn't know they had a president who was assassinated Yeah and that would have been 78 or 79 I think um and then the leaders right after him declare martial law and this all just comes to a boiling point on may 18th 1980 uh students in guangju are protesting martial law and the special forces there who would also ostensibly be under american control because of this agreement you know we have military bases there Mm -hmm. we collaborate so much with them the special forces there uh start killing protesters beating rape uh, they fire on protesters and 
that in response, the citizens of Guangzhou, not just students, there's this giant uprising where they raid all these police stations and armories and stuff. And it's it lasts for days. Um, it's a huge chapter in Korean history. And I'm not like I can't do the whole thing. It, it's like a it's a thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Wikipedia article is very long and very upsetting. Uh, the official death toll stands at 230 dead, but the human rights group Asia Watch has it closer to 2,000. Wow. I'm going to lean towards believing the latter, the human rights watch group, because if any country is the one telling and it, they were the ones who killed the their citizens. They're probably yeah. cleaning up those numbers a bit. Uh, but yeah, because the South Korean military and U.S. military are intertwined, yeah, this is just does nothing but stoke anti-American sentiment. So you've got, you know, throughout the 80s, because that happened in 1980, there's an arson attack on the U.S. Information Center in Seoul. 1982, there's arson attacks on the U.S. Cultural Center in Busan. There's demonstrations throughout the country before Reagan comes to visit in 83. 85, there's an occupation of the U.S. Cultural Center in Seoul in which protesters demanded an apology for the Guangzhou massacre. So now we're moving into the early 2000s, and this is kind of, you know, some more specific context for the host and what's informing the tone of this movie and Bong Joon-ho's attitude especially. Tensions between America and South Korea in 2002 are stoked when South Korean Olympic speed skater Kim Dong Sung, I remember this too. Kim Dong Sung comes in first place but is disqualified from winning the gold medal for blocking the second place winner, American Apollo Ono. Do you remember Apollo Ono? You don't I remember the name. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Th- yeah. This, this was such a big, I mean, this was huge. So America wins the gold and everyone is pissed. What do you mean blocking? It's a, th- it's like an interference thing. It's, this is getting into technical sports shit and okay. I didn't, but I think it was a thing where, the South Korean skater is in first, Apollo Ono is in second, but he can't get ahead because he's being blocked oh, by the, okay. but it's a thing okay. where no one can agree on whether or not it was technically an illegal move. Mm-hmm. And I think I think the majority of people now think that it was bullshit that the South Korean got disqualified. Um, so yeah, everyone's mad at America again. <laughs> and a lot of this anger is just at America in general, um, especially because this comes right after George W. Bush just named North Korea a member of the Axis of Evil, yeah, which is Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. So you might be wondering, well, why is South Korea mad that North Korea is being named as part of this axis of evil? But you have to remember that we just had one Korea not too long ago. They haven't been two separate countries for that long. So people have family in North Korea. And even uh, I think, yeah, South Korea implemented this policy, the sunshine policy. And what this is, is it's basically just like, I don't want to say neutral uh, attitudes towards North Korea, but basically people from South Korea, I think, are, they're allowed to visit family. It's a pretty, like, we just, we don't want anything to get fucky. We just want to, like, keep it chill. We know people have family in North Korea. Let's just, you know, the policy is, like, let's all just stay calm. Um, Obviously, that policy's been criticized because it's a little bit lax on you know, North Korea's human rights violation. You know, it's like, well, are we being complicit if we're just sitting here and pretending it's all chill? But um, so, yeah, when you name North Korea a member of this axis of evil, it's going to be scary to be in South Korea because now there's going to be tension stoked between the two countries. In this article I was reading, it was saying that if you were on message boards at the time where South Koreans were talking about Apollo Ono and that whole thing, like, it was pretty common that that conversation would just turn to other problems that people had with America, particularly the United States forces. It's the USFK, United States forces Korea. And that's like the like the United States military that's in Korea that Mm -hmm. came up often because people have an issue with it. And later that exact same year, this is another big chapter in this kind of anti-American movement in South Korea. Later in 2002, a U.S. military convoy is doing a training exercise near, uh, near Yangju, and one of the vehicles hits and kills two 14-year-old schoolgirls, Shin mi and Shin hyo Sun. So the USFK, and again, that's the United States Forces Korea, it's like our military over there, uh, they refused to let the two men who were 
controlling that vehicle be tried under South Korean jurisdiction and instead they're tried under the American military courts and found not guilty. Yeah. Um, so that uh, is a shit show after that happens to the point where you have stores refusing to stock any American goods, food, anything like snacks. I think this article cited like Oreos for some reason. Um, Americans are turned away from businesses in South Korea. Demonstrations outside the American embassy grow to be around 300,000 in size. Thousands more people in other cities besides Seoul and Busan where there's the biggest size protest. But it's like such a big thing that both countries' governments are freaked out because people are so pissed. What year is this? 2002. Okay. But yeah, there's this kind of unique protection afforded to American forces in Korea. This really unfair protection where it just seems like they can get away with whatever they want. And particularly an instance often cited by people as as one that really helped stoke this kind of tension is in the U.S. base in Yongsan, these military officials dumped formaldehyde into the water system and that pollutes the the Han River. Is there a reason given for why they do it? Uh, Just disposal? Yeah. Okay. Just get rid of stuff. Dump it in the river. And that takes us to the beginning of this movie because yeah. that is the incident which is depicted in the beginning of The Host. It is even, it's in the year 2000 and everything. It is literally that exact it is, and yeah, I mean, I don't think there's, there's not a reason. <laughs> just he even, I, the, I think the reason is he's the bottles he are picks dusty. Up the bottles, yeah, and he's like, these are just laying around. Can we just dump these? Mm-hmm. It's Scott Wilson too, R.I.P. Just yeah, passed away from The Walking Dead. So yeah, that takes us to the beginning. I hope that gives some context. It does. If, yeah. It, hopefully, it wasn't too because dry. the brother in this film and uh, forgive me going forward i'm going to be so bad pronouncing these names uh but i'm going to keep trying uh nam mm -hmm. the the alcoholic brother he's like a political activist yes which is why he can wield those molotov cocktails with such ease in the end yeah so you want to just start going through the movie itself sure yeah, so okay, we've we've polluted the Han River. Mm -hmm. The reason yeah, the reason that that guy says it's fine is well the Han River is very big. The way he <laughs> explains it to this his uh like a South yeah, his South Korean is, is just so condescending. Yeah, just it's right such off a the good bat. Scene, just like dude. the river's big. So and just try to so No, just, it's like it's a broad river, so try to think broadly about yes. this. <laughs> and just the, yeah, his assistant is just like, but this would be bad. Yeah, Bong Joon-ho, like, his movies, he has such a way of depicting people in positions of authority that make you immediately understand why everyone who works underneath them fucking hates them. <laughs> or, you know, he gets you to understand why people are pissed at different things. He does such a good job. It's of also it. just so funny. Yeah, he, his movies are so funny in a really dark, very dark way. Mm -hmm. There's scenes in this in particular where I wasn't sure if I was supposed to think it was funny or not. And then he almost gives you permission to laugh at it when you're not really sure yeah if something is funny or not what like the uh memorial yes that's what i was, I was about of. to cry during that scene yeah. it was so touching and then it became hilarious and then it's a slapstick it's i don't know how he does it yeah he it's it's really something um so we kind of go we flip through the years a little bit i think we jumped to 2002 there's uh, like some see a fishermen. Fish. Yeah. I they... just imagine Blinky from The Simpsons. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, I bet the monster was kind of cute when it was a little mutated <laughs> baby. And then uh, we flip forward some more. There's a guy who he jumps off the bridge and he sees something. And then we can just see this thing is growing. Later, mm -hmm. that guy's body is pulled out of the river. It's on TV. Half his body's missing. Mm -hmm. So maybe our monster friend has acquired a taste for, for people. <laughs> does the monster have a name? In, uh, I don't think it like, does. does. Fan base gave it a name or anything? We should name him. I think it's... Um, or is see. it just called the host? Oh, it's the, the Guo... Guomol. The what? Yeah, man, I don't know. How do you spell it? G W O E M U L. Oh, man. The Guomol? Guomol. 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 Apologies again. <laughs> it sounds like a sad, melty Pokemon. Guomol. <laughs> 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 
Uh, or it just makes you kind of sad when it pops out of the Pokeball like a magic cart where you're like, oh man. Yeah, you got stuck <laughs> with the Pokeball. <laughs> Hey, we want to talk to you about our sponsor this week, TheraOne CBD products. I love CBD so much. I'm an anxious person, yeah. and I'm also a person that exercises. <laughs> and both those things, uh, it's very helpful to get some CBD every once in a while. And sleeping, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. That helps me sleep so much. It's awesome. Thera One is part. It's part of Thera Body, and they do that Thera gun that I've seen people at our local gym use oh, yeah. in the before times. In the before times. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, the the doctor behind that, Doctor Jason Versland, Versland, <laughs> discovered <laughs> that when he used CBD, like oil and lotion in conjunction with the like Thera, the Thera gun, which is it's just like a big massage thing that he saw a really good that that sounds nice too oh yeah it yeah does. he saw like really good results when he used those two together they have warming cbd lotion you can use that cooling lotion or massage oil i'm like that sounds so good <laughs> but yeah so if you don't feel like ingesting cbd by cbd is not thc it's not like, psychoactive it's not psychoactive yeah but if you still are iffy i may be ingesting it uh, this will be a nice way to try CBD products that don't involve actually, yeah, ingesting it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to try TheraOne CBD now through Labor Day, and that's Monday, September 7th, TheraOne is offering our listeners a buy one, get one free for all TheraOne products. Nice. <laughs> but you have to go to theragun.com slash deadmeat, and that's theragun.com slash deadmeat. And if you don't love what you get from TheraOne, send it back for a full refund within 30 days of purchase. That is flexible. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that this is not something TheraOne's likely to do again. This seems like a, we're doing this once, come and get it kind of deal. We're doing this TheraOne. TheraOne. Better get in there. Buy one, get one free at theragon.com slash dead meat, but only until Labor Day. So go on, get <laughs> <laughs> Theragun.com slash Demi. Our other sponsor this week is Shudder. Shudder. We love Shudder so much. Yeah. Um, you know Shudder. It's the Netflix of horror. Mm -hmm. I think it's the, it's the accurate way to describe Hell it. Oh yeah, it is. Yes. And, you know, again, why don't you clarify this episode is, is the host, not host. Yep. Which is now on Shudder and... My friends, that movie's so scary. And yes. I'm not even just saying that for the ad. No. I don't even think that movie they is They didn't tell us to talk about host, but I'll talk about host. They didn't, host. yeah. Yeah. That, I, was, I was grabbing your hand tight. Oh, my God. <laughs> I That movie, you'll have your uh, a full diaper after that movie. It's also only 56 minutes, which is awesome. Oh, amazing. Make more hour-long horror movies. Yes, I'm a big fan of the hour-long movie. I, I don't get bored by the end. It's awesome. Oh, man. <laughs> So yeah, it's worth like just go check that out. You can you get a free trial if you want by using our promo code Shutter free for thirty days. Shutter.com use promo code Deadmeat thirty. That's Deadmeat three zero if you want to watch host and get real scared. And that's Shutter.com S H U D D D D R. -E -R. Like ooh. Yeah, not like like. Black. Get out of here, son. There's shutter sounds. Yeah. <laughs> not that one. Not not that kind. So go to shutter.com. Promo code Demi30. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> a little burp. <laughs> yeah, so our family here that we're going to be following, it's like, you know, very, uh, you can see the connection between this and Parasite. This and Parasite are such a good, like, double feature mm -hmm. they have it's, so much in common i fucking love all these characters in this family it, yeah the dad uh not like the main character dad the but grandpa the grandfather uh is it he bong again apologies park he bong, he, yeah. he bong. i fucking love that character he's so funny so much he you can immediately tell the kind of guy this is because like i would imagine that he comes from very low like 
Uh, he knows how to hustle. Like he, even, yeah. He he tries bribing. Um, he a few times. A couple he, of times he makes he's his bribing. way through the world via bribes. But like, you can also tell that like his parents were probably farmers or something yeah. that were very rural mm-hmm. and and uh had less money. But then he has formed his own business, this food stand, and he is so proud of his. Uh, one son who's a college graduate, so he should be able to do anything. He's a college graduate. He's unemployed, but you know what? He he, still he went has to college. Yeah. yeah, and his daughter is an uh, Olympic, or I, I don't know about Olympic, but she's, she's an a archer, medalist. Yeah. yeah, an archer, and he even cares about uh, Park Gong Du, who is our main character, even though he's kind of a a fuck off. But he can tell that his heart's in the right place and he's got this granddaughter. But just you can tell exactly what kind of character he is because he like believes in the system. He believes that like because he worked hard and was able to find this level of success and put his kid through college that like that kid should be able to do anything with his college degree. And at one point he says, well, if our government said that this thing is happening, that it's, it's got to be true. Yeah, and it's like you're he, right. He totally believes in the. It's weird. He simultaneously, like, he believes in the system, but I think he also believes in the capacity for it to be, you know, massaged a little bit, exploited. Because, like, oh, for you sure. Know, I think he just accepts that as part it's of part it. It's part of it. It's right. just part of it. Yeah. Well, that's sometimes also, you got to bribe someone. It's funny because as long as we're talking about just the fact that you know maybe they're oh we'll, we'll, you know we'll push some things around a little bit we'll be we'll work around the edges a little bit like working within the system but we'll allow a little bit of like you know. Because you, you got to get ahead somehow. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of when they, they talk later about this idea of, and I'm going to pronounce it, Siori, C-O-E, yeah. the, um, it's the right of the hungry. I was actually reading about that tradition, and that actually sounds, the way you described it, is literally the attitude behind this kind of folk tradition, from my understanding anyway, if I'm not describing this correctly at all please let me know but it's the idea of when you are living in a rural community especially um and this is i think it was more of a thing maybe pre i would probably pre-korean war Mm -hmm. this is very pastoral but it's this idea this like yearly tradition that you know if there are times where food is scarce it's basically acceptable for kids specifically children and maybe teens to run around to different farms and steal food um and among the community it's permitted up to a point i think if you push it you're punished Mm -hmm. you know but it's even just like oh you kids yeah but the whole idea of it is it's like you know yes it's technically wrong to steal but we're prioritizing the well-being of kids who are hungry you know let them steal and hey they're learning how to harvest crops <laughs> they are learning how to communicate and coordinate with each other to pull off like bean heists and stuff <laughs> it's really interesting and it's this idea of placing importance on not necessarily your kids being perfectly disciplined but like making you know your kids getting themselves fed and taking care of themselves yeah because that's a scene with Siju again I'm sorry uh who was with his brother Sijin it's after all the crazy stuff has happened and they're they go into that food stand and they're taking the food and and Siju wants to take money as well but Sijin says no that's not part of it you like that would be stealing yeah taking the yeah. food is okay that's not theft that's uh yeah what's it called I'm sorry uh Siori yes I think and even just like while we're kind of talking about yeah, this concept of like, no, 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 if we take the money, it's theft. Or like, it's okay if kids steal up to a point. And we have this tradition that is, to us as Americans, is very bizarre. But that's why when we were talking about the U.S. occupying Korea and trying to restructure their industry and, you know, goods, food, everything. Why, when you come in and you don't understand that there are things like that where even just a a local tradition that prioritizes feeding someone over making like to americans we're like but prof like Mm -hmm. no we have to have it be this way and to us that kind of tradition is super weird and prioritizes stuff that like wouldn't even occur to Mm -hmm. us anyway i just thought that was interesting Hmm. Yeah. yeah yeah they're living on the beach seems pretty cool uh, just living in that yeah. food stand. Uh, 
Uh, Gangdu eats one of his customers' squid legs. Yeah. But he is not a poor child, so that does not stand by. But I love <laughs> it's how not the same. It's not the same, but I love how Hee Hong, like, he disciplines him, but, like, in a gentle way, and is like, like, think of it from the customer's like, perspective. Come on, man. Like, yeah. Just a very <laughs> Joe Biden. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, like, come on, man. Go come give on. him a beer. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> That's the thing, too, is this whole family and the characters in his movies in general, it's not like this in Parasite. I think maybe there's this concept of foreign film and foreign film characters being stuffy. I think if you ask someone to like, what do you what words do you associate with foreign film? Mm -hmm. Maybe pretentious, mm -hmm. you know. Um, snobby, stuffy, but dude, his characters, you just want to hang out and have a beer with. Yeah. They're so fun. And even, yeah, the teen daughter. Oh, uh, she's so good. She's so good in this. The, his his teen daughter, um, what's her name? Hunsio. Hunsio. Uh, Hunsio. She even, yeah, her dad gives her a beer. And like, you're in middle school you're now. You're in middle school now. <laughs> you can have a beer, which I love. Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, yeah, she immediately just you can tell how bright she is and she just really is very captivating while she's sitting there watching uh uh the the aunt namju on tv with uh gangdu and they're sitting there watching and she's just like you're you're supposed to be my dad and she's just very <laughs> clever very uh resourceful as we see later yeah i think she's embarrassed by her dad but she still clearly loves him mm -hmm. um, definitely it's like uh yeah it's you know, she definitely, I don't think she like resents him necessarily. No, no, And he's all. trying to save up money to get her a new oh, phone, yeah, so which sweet. reminded me a lot of Parasite too. Just this like attempt to save money. And it's just coins and then yeah. instant. I really think food, like food is really important in his movies. Because I think of this Parasite, Snowpiercer, there's a lot oh, yeah. going on with food in that movie and like class and how it relates to food. Because mm -hmm. you think of this movie... And all this food we see in the beginning, because they work in this little kiosk, and all the food is prepackaged. Even the, the squid he's making looks not good. I don't know what <laughs> kind of snack it is. I'm assuming it's because it's like f like food truck food. I don't. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't like serve that for a family dinner. I'm assuming just because it's like a kiosk food. Yeah. I feel like the equivalent of maybe French fries or something here. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I could be totally off base, but I think it's striking when you realize all this food throughout this whole movie is all like this prepackaged store food until the end where he's serving his kind of new adoptive son we're skipping ahead this whole movie <laughs> he's serving hit this kid that he's taking care of a real like it's it looks completely different than all the food we've seen mm. beforehand and same with parasite you have the family gorging themselves on food when they take over the rich people's house like yeah. food is so important to this director, clearly. But yeah, so this monster shows up. Yeah, hanging it, from the bridge. Yeah, he's hanging from the bridge like a bat or like a Spider-Man kind of. droops right in. So the monster's effects. They're not good. I would say that for 2006, they're fine most of the time. Uh, bad very rarely, just occasionally. I think at the end when it catches fire, the first shot of it catching fire when the flame spreads, the fire... But fire's hard. Fire's yeah, real hard to do. Yeah, any natural textures are really hard. But a l I think a lot of the time, it looks pretty damn good. Yeah, and it's really interesting that even though... Because they were working with... Their budget, I think, was, was big in terms of... I think maybe Korean film industry standards, but like big, like global scale. Like this is not a big budget movie. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a limited effects budget. I'm Bong Joon-ho knows this. And yet he shows you so much of this fucking monster. <laughs> yeah, and like right at the beginning it. too, you see the whole, like it's not a mystery, which I think is really cool. It's just because it's not what this movie's about. I mean, it is. It's the driving thing of this film. Yeah, I remember the first time I watched this, I was a little, I think I uh, was miscalibrated before See, watching it. I and think I, my expectations for this were, this is about being, this is a horror movie. It's about this monster and then being very underwhelmed by the creature itself and not being very, there are, there are terrifying moments, but you know. 
Yeah, second half of this, uh, the first time I watched, I was like, "What? What is this?" Yeah, because it's a family drama where yeah. a monster happens to have grabbed one of the members of the family. Yeah, and the horror is not explicitly this monster the entire time. Because mm-hmm. when you think about how much of the horror in this movie and how many of the sequences where there's tension or suspense, it's not like there's so much else going on. Often it's the government chasing them is is a but even those are mostly played for laughs yeah because you know like when he gets away i guess this will just be an episode where we bounce all yeah we fuck it uh because i was thinking this when we were watching it there are two like escape scenes one when the family together escapes the quarantine and they're running around in the parking garage and like uh (laughs) the the, sister's really slow slow, like oh my god loop back around to get her it's so funny and it's also very funny as they're they're driving up the spiral <laughs> the <guy> running after <laughs> yeah him? like up oh in circles God, it's in the so parking garage funny. so there's that and then there's later on near the end of the film when gongdu uh takes a nurse hostage yes. and is able to get out of there and escape in an ambulance and those two scenes i think show that yeah it's hard you know, this is one of those that's it's really hard for me to say whether I think it's a horror movie or not. Obviously, it's, you know, at least nudging up against the genre, but those scenes are played for such laughs, mm-hmm. especially the first one. It's very funny, but those scenes in any I think American movie about a infectious disease, there's no way the character mm. gets out with a single nurse hostage. They'll just shoot that nurse and that character. Like, I mean, and not even just American films. I've been going over the rec movies mm-hmm. lately. Anyone in those rec movies will have just opened fire to contain what they assume is a virus. Whereas with this, with one scalpel, this guy who apparently has this very infectious disease is able to get out of there. So it's like I don't find horror in uh, the the government containing them because they're so ineffective with it. Mm-hmm. I guess the horror if there is any is um and i don't even know if i would describe it as horror can he get back with his daughter which is yeah. what i want to see the whole time well then i also think there's a lot of horror inherent in the idea of there's not a virus yeah that reveal is terrifying they lobotomize him and it's horrible that's the other thing is they lobotomize him but he seems after that scene to be i don't know how that works yeah, I, he seems to be fine. He's not. He's he doesn't seem like Jack Nicholson at the end of one. Yeah, yeah, Spoiler yeah. Alert. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really to the point where I wasn't sure. Like, did he have a lobotomy? But the Wikipedia the Wikipedia says, says lobotomy, yeah. but I don't know if I buy that. I they might have just taken the brain sample, but can you? That's do what that I without, thought. Is it was just say, like a I do. Sample? I don't know. I don't know how brains work. <laughs> I should. But that whole enough. thing is terrifying. That is too. Uh, yeah, especially with the American guy who is played he by... He looks like Tim Robinson. Paul Lazar. He's in a scene in Silence of the Lambs. He's flirting with... Uh, they're like looking over some bugs. I just looked it up before we started recording. Oh my God. Because I saw that he was in Silence yes! of the Lambs and he like yes! flirts with Clarice. And she, oh he's like kind of cute. She's like, are you hitting on me? And he's like, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, He's, he looks a lot younger in it, wow. but that scene is very uh, upsetting because he pretends to be on Gangdu's side for so long. He's like, "Why didn't you go to the news?" Like, "Oh God, your your daughter's still alive." And then he just says, "Yeah, clearly the guy's crazy because he's saying all this." Yeah, and it's that classic flip of like the government is not going to help you. Yeah, and I even him asking, "Well, why didn't you go to the police?" I don't. I don't even know if I interpret that as him being on his side. I think it's more of this frustration. It's like we always do this to people, where it's like, "Oh, something bad happened to you," instead of undertaking maybe the uh, emotional strain of "I'm going to go out of my way to help you." I'm just gonna like, you know there's nothing I can do. Well, why didn't you do anything Mm -hmm. instead of maybe taking some responsibility? It's just the idea that no matter who you tell, they're going to try and pass off your burden to someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's terrifying. It's worth noting that not every American in this movie is depicted as a bad person. Because that Sergeant, Mm Mm-hmm who gets in, he, like, is very heroic. It's Mm -hmm. when the monster, uh, it's kind of where we left off when we were going chronologically, the monster comes out of the water. By the way, that setting, 
that like beachside setting with the long slope of a bank, mm-hmm. uh, the concrete it's so bank. Cool. It's such a good it's setting. It's so good, yeah. Yeah, it, it had been a while since I had last seen this movie, but I remembered that setting and also some of the overpasses that they're hanging out with. Just this whole movie looks so cool and is also just shot so it's, well. Yeah. Like when he grabs the uh, pole and you see, the, it's you like see it over the top out, of the trucks. Yeah. Just like little shots like that. I'm like, oh, this, I fucking love movies sometimes when they're shot like it's this. So but yeah, there's like an American sergeant who would, uh, I assume, would be part of the U.S. forces mm-hmm. in Korea. And mm-hmm. he is with uh, a lady friend and the monster's going out. He's like, hey, I have to go help those people. And he like puts himself in danger and he's helping Gong Do. And uh, he gets, uh, I think he loses an arm. He's talked about on the yeah, news. Yeah, he loses an arm and eventually eventually dies and that what they say is that he succumbed to this virus yeah and i kind of interpret him as like because yeah the, the only t- thing we see of him is like he's an objectively good character yeah he's you really know? helping he's, out he, yeah he's trying to help he puts himself in danger to help others and i just you know the way i see that character is like sure yeah like totally there are americans serving that are they're good people and ultimately it's this the organization itself will just use you yeah. to further their own ends. They Because they say he has a virus. Yeah. Which doesn't exist. And it's so fucking sad, this like object in this movie, objective hero. Mm-hmm. He's, you know, we see him for two he has no flaws. He's like the good <laughs> character. His death then is used to perpetuate this total lie yeah. and ultimately it's so fucked that we have americans or in general people who are serving and maybe have this idea of like no i want to do this to to do good and to help people but it's like this ultimate tragedy when their you know sacrifice is then used to not help people (laughs) to perpetuate a lie i also think that there's a cut and i didn't write it down uh i think it involves that guy that sergeant oh this is what happens again obviously spoiler alert it's when the dad dies he bombs yes when he gets killed by the monster and it cuts uh you hear the voiceover of the news saying a tragedy happened And then it cuts to the news and it's talking about the sergeant having died. And it's like, no, the tragedy is like, like, yeah, that's sad. But we just saw that awesome He Bong die. Yeah. And like the the news doesn't care about it. They're talking about the American in South Korea instead of a South Korean casualty. And that that really stuck with me. Yeah. And these are, yeah, it's not a tragedy when people who aren't going along with our plan die. Because this is more convenient for us, actually, (laughs) to have this dude out of our way. Mm -hmm. Especially since he's someone who you know if you're running back over to this river area maybe you realize or are able to put together the fact that there's not a virus yeah Yeah. and he's he's just anyone as it's said a couple of times in the movie Mm -hmm. like they're like we can't just go tracing calls for just anyone like not people of your class right yeah yeah they're they're a very uncouth group of people yeah (laughs) and like this the class thing too because that also you mentioned the scene where they're all mourning and they're in the the gym. It reminded me because a gymnasium is also used in Parasite after the flood in that movie. Oh, they yeah. house a bunch of people, including the the main family. I think is it the son who ends up in the some I forget who ends up in that gymnasium. Uh, but he gets a call from the rich wife. And is like, oh, this flood, how inconvenient. My yeah. party. Meanwhile, the family lost their entire home and they're mm-hmm. all shoved into this gymnasium. And I thought of the same thing here where it's this makeshift like morning station set up in this gym. It's like a memorial with all the pictures of the victims. Yeah. And it's like this weird because, yeah, when you think of like disaster relief and stuff and for people who are poor and don't have anywhere else to go, you just throw them in a gym because we do that here too. You think of imagery from Katrina, Katrina and yeah. stuff, and that would have been around the same time. And it's like we don't have places, or even just we don't have the mental capacity to understand that shit like this can happen, like unexpected death, unexpected loss, flood. Um, 
So we put we just put people in gymnasiums where the primary purpose of this room we're putting them in isn't so that they can mourn. It's like this is a, a gym. It's where like we're just converting it. So like, OK, this is your temporary house, your temporary place where you can cry about your dead daughter. And you, clearly it's just this it's an inconvenience and it's like just something to kind of be ogled. You have the photographers coming in and taking pictures oh, of them writhing on the floor. And that's when it, I feel like he's letting you know you can laugh at this scene and that it's supposed to be funny. But before then, it's like, fuck, this is really Yeah, sad. I really almost cried because it's, you know, the picture of the daughter among all the other victims and the family members are crying. And then uh, uh, the sister shows up and then the drunk brother shows yeah. up, Namil. And then they're saying, oh, son, who... Uh, or, I'm sorry, Hyun So, uh, you brought us all together, like mm-hmm. in your death. Like, look, look, your brother brought you this, and and uh, your aunt brought you her the medal, bronze. I did the laugh. Bronze medal. Yeah, that like, was look. the first thing where I'm like, is that was it's, that funny? It's totally. It's, it's such like dark humor, it's, but the fact yeah. that it's like because she she wins the bronze medal because she fucks up. She like waits too long to shoot. She so like she, freezes. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, look, your aunt brought you her bronze medal. <laughs> and so like I'm <laughs> literally on the verge of crying. And then they start like hitting each other and getting into a fight and they fall over and they're crying and, and the photogra- photographers and then there's run someone up. someone who comes in and is the like hazma- the Hyundai. Yeah, there's the Hyundai parked in front. You need to move it. <laughs> That's right. And then the hazmat comes guy comes in and like Falls, slips yeah. and then just like it's, tr- it's so many it's funny like such a, It's like just such a definitely threaded needle of like this is yeah. sad but also so fucking also funny. namil when they're fighting does an amazing little basement drop kick he yes. like does like a fucking seated drop kick to gondu <laughs> and it's dope i thought i would mention to the hazmat suit guy reminded me and the the scene with the whole family together kind of reminded me i wanted to mention i love how important the color yellow is in this film because you have the hazmat suits are all bright yellow, and that's a point that's made repeatedly. They find, I don't know who they're taught, the like guys that they pay, the, to break the shady out. dudes to yeah. break them out. Yeah, they get hazmat suits, but they're like, no, these are supposed to be yellow, dad. Like, what mm-hmm. the hell? So the yellow hazmat suits, I think of caution tape. Agent yellow, Agent yellow. is dispersed as a plan, Agent Orange. From Vietnam. Um, yeah. They constantly call the uh, Guangzhou, our main character, Blondie. He has like. Like oh, dyed yeah. hair it's like highlighted mm-hmm. i'm trying to think of what else there's so much use of yellow but yeah what i i was like i wonder i was curious if if yellow because different cultures associate colors with different things so i'm like trying to analyze this through my american brain is different than like you know like what does the korean director mean with the color yellow if that's going to be very different so i was like okay We'll look up what kind of you know yellow represents, and I thought it was interesting that the it's the te the teguk oh, man. <laughs> My pro- our pronunciation. We're so sorry. And so this it's okay. So that's a symbol on the the Kore- the South Korean flag. It's the red and blue like yin yang almost looking circle. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the case where it's like the red and blue together, that's associated with it's like traditional Korean beliefs, uh, religious beliefs, positive and negative cosmic forces uh but there's also a version of that symbol where you have three colors the the taeguk you have the yellow red and blue and red and blue in that context i guess represent heaven and earth and the yellow when you have it in like that tricolor circle represents humanity which i thought was kind of cool so yellow in that specific context especially when you realize i'm pretty sure that her the daughter's uniform is red and blue her school outfit it's like this red and blue plaid and so i like the idea a lot of you know the dad and daughter are red yellow and blue and in that scene i double checked screen caps to look when you have the whole family mourning together the sisters wearing red and the brothers wearing blue i like to like just speaking about the visuals and stuff i don't even know if this is that subtle or if I'm clever at all for picking this up but I love that the agent yellow and the monster look the exact same when they're hanging because the agent yellow is like dispersed through like this hanging pod it's thing like a diffuse, it's like an aromatherapy diffuser but it's it, like this yeah it looks banana. like uh what's Wally's little love interest Eva isn't that doesn't it kind of look a like little, a little bit, bit like Eva? yeah it's this yellow but it's 
they I think they even show it at one point kind of hanging from the same spot yeah. by this bridge that the monster hangs from. They're the same shape and everything, which I think is kind of neat. I like yeah. the visual parallels there. I was reading a, a take on this film that I thought was really interesting. And, you know, speaking of the idea of maybe yellow representing just humanity generally, I read a really good review and I, I can't remember who if, if I find it again I'll link it I was reading a bunch of stuff about this movie but they said they think this movie is just about how like the capacity of people to be evil and like brazenly evil like everything is so out in the open in this movie like the the beginning where it's like now nah, just dump the shit down the drain mm-hmm. or the guy who's like yeah we need to get rid of this dude this guy's nuts like we don't believe him and you know people refusing to help each other it's just everyone in the like there's just so much you know capacity for everyone to just act like dicks in this movie. everyone and like the the friend who betrays the brother oh yeah it's just everyone being fucking dicks and straight out to like not even really trying to hide it and that also i think plays into why the monster we just see it right away mm-hmm. it's just evil out in the open like there's nothing hidden or subversive about it it's just doing stuff and getting away with it which when we go back to our history lesson from earlier that's part of the resentment south koreans have against americans is this idea that they can just do they can just do shit and yeah you know like not hide it because then there's workarounds and stuff i thought that was really interesting yeah you have the protests too as kind of a backdrop to this movie especially like in the later half we see a lot of these protests and we know that the brother uh was into that in college and he meets up with that friend who ultimately betrays him but it's this friend who unlike the brother has gotten a job out of college and but he's all he's in debt yeah he is in debt (laughs) yeah he's he's like that's why he's going to put him in for the reward money yeah and it just it's this heartbreak like i think there's there's a few things going on there one is it's just this heartbreaking inevitability of like we are so dependent on money and i know this is something bong joon ho is like that this is a thing and you know a parasite especially he's mm-hmm. like we live under the, i think he's like this, this parasite called capitalism or that was like a quote oh, yeah, from his interviews is, yeah. i fucking love him uh <laughs> but just this this dependence on money and currency and even if you ultimately are have a desire to be a good person and to do the right thing this guy's in debt you know, it's stuff like that that forces your hand and makes people make choices that, you know, maybe they wouldn't have thought they were capable of earlier. But he doesn't even seem to regret it when, you know, his the friend runs out or when the brother runs out, the friend and gives him like the... It's always <laughs> that to me, like this, the other aspect of this that's so unnerving is it's like, I, you know, I had to sell you out, but I'm, I'm still with you, so... Mm-hmm. I'm still good, you Mm -hmm. know? I'm going to give you the power fist, even though in action I did the wrong... Like, I, you know... Like, he didn't have to do that to his friend. Like, you know, he he could have chosen to just be in debt and do the right thing here, but it's just... I think maybe it's this idea that people will lie to themselves like that and think, well, if if I mentally am on the side of good Mm -hmm. then it's good you know i you know with my intentions are good yeah but you know does that make sense Mm -hmm. i think there's like a lot going on with that character even though we don't even see him for that much yeah i don't even know if he's given a name Uh, he's credited i think yeah like fat guevara yeah yeah uh and that guy is a uh writer and director I saw that, yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of the actors in this, by the way, are basically just recurring players in Bong Joon Ho movies, which yeah. is really cool. Yeah. I mean the uh Song Kang Ho who plays Gongdu yes, is the dad, the dad in Parasite. In Par- which so. was so cuz I saw or I saw the host years ago and it was so weird seeing him even though he's still playing it just he seems so much older. Well yeah cuz I think in the host he's about 39 40 and then in uh Parasite early 50s yeah. and, so, and he's yeah. also just playing you know, like this, he's, I mean, the dyed hair and everything. He's, mm-hmm. he's just a little younger. slacker dad kind of. Yeah. And then in that one, yeah, he's a more like put upon aged weary. Mm-hmm. He's also in Snowpiercer. Yeah, that's right. And then, uh, yeah, I believe, uh, I think 
the the daughter is also in Snowpiercer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like he uses a lot of the same people. Which yeah, is always cool. Also, you know what? That actually makes me think of a thought I had watching this movie. I wonder if he's a Wes Anderson fan because oh, I'm sure he is. Some of his shots kind of reminded me of a little bit, and then the humor that like dark. It's very Wes Anderson. Yeah, that dark just... humor, and then just the, the, reusing the same cast made me think of it. But I would love to know. I'm sure if he, he has is. ever cited Wes Anderson as. I just assume at this point because I know Bong Joon Ho is a like. Because this movie was a limited release when it came out, and I think a reason it got maybe a bit bigger or people started to get more into it or at least heard of it is because of Quentin Tarantino Tarantino, that's right because he you know talked a ton about it and you know was a big fan of Bong Joon-ho's work but I think by that point especially now I think just all directors in general are like obsessed with Bong Joon I think just (laughs) you know it's I I think they're all just fans of each other Mm -hmm. and I love it it's really good and wholesome (laughs) (laughs) I found the homeless guy at the end interesting because you don't expect that guy to just up and become a character and get in on the final fight against the monster. Mm-hmm. Like, he plays a big role in that. And, uh, yeah, he's a homeless guy who, like, he saves Nam Il, gives him a, his bed to sleep in, mm-hmm. uh, you know, his sleeping bag on the ground. And then Nam Il wakes up and immediately starts, like, oh, these are useful things that I could use. And, oh, this bag is really good. Let me use this for the thing I want. Here, I'll give you money just so you're not put out. And the guy smashes a bottle over yeah. his head and is like think you can just get anything with money but then goes to help him anyway yeah i found that so interesting like the guy was like no fuck you but i'll help you yeah because yeah i love the idea that money at this point in this universe means nothing <laughs> like we're living in a world where there's this giant radiation monster run. it's like money is nothing anymore and then also just him to me, like, he feels like the kind of character, and we see this in real life, too, where, like, people who have nothing to lose, I think he's very purposely depicted as homeless, like, he's sleeping outside, they'll throw down, because it's <laughs> like, when you've got nothing to lose, why not? Mm-hmm. And to me, that's kind of an incredible thing to witness, is, again, it's, you know, and the, I feel comfortable saying this, because it is a Bong Joon-ho movie, it's like, when you place so much emphasis on possession, on money, on things that if you lose them are hard to get back and it's viewed as like this moral failing if you lose them, if you lose money, if you lose a home, it's oh, it's weakness, you know? And this idea that if you're removed from that constraint, if we don't have that priority, if that's not hanging over everyone's heads, like maybe people are more willing to stick their neck out for everyone else. and. Yeah, yeah, I wonder, because, like, so this homeless guy is homeless, but he's not in debt, as opposed to Nam Il's right. friend, who is, he said, Money he has, is like, hanging over his exactly. head. Exactly, so that's why he turns his back on Nam Il, whereas the homeless guy is willing to fucking go out of yeah, his way to help him because out. because money is not a restriction to that character. Yeah. Money to the character in debt means something, mm-hmm. and is currently something weighing on him and holding him back, and maybe to him feels like a, a personal failing, but this character who doesn't have any money... Doesn't but, care about but it. But yeah, because it means nothing. Even, yeah, your money means nothing. Oh, that's a great... Those two characters being uh, like, like, foils for each other. Yeah, so especially because they, you know, both they betray and help the same character. Exactly, yeah. I think they're... Yeah, to- I think they're definitely counterparts to each other. Love Bong joon <laughs> I know. This like that's the thing about this movie. I is. could just keep peeling this this movie back, <laughs> like the layers of this movie, and just feel more like fuck yeah about it. Because it's all just his movies, like they're they're dark, but they're also just at the end. Like as much as he makes you so angry with people, at the end of the day, it is people in these movies who give you hope by the end too. I know that's why it, it is crushing that. Uh, Hanso dies. But she dies helping another kid. And she does, really... yeah, she gives her life to protect the the younger, mm-hmm. like, a homeless kid, the orphan, because yeah. he didn't have parents and his older brother died from the monster. 
And yeah, she protected him from getting killed. And then he gets adopted by mm-hmm. her dad in the end, which is real nice. But it's because I had forgotten that she died. Yeah. So the whole movie I was like, because I mean, that first scene at her, the memorial, mm-hmm. I couldn't remember. I know it's the entire fucking plot of this movie <laughs> is them finding say, her, yeah. but I didn't remember <laughs> that. So like, I thought she was dead. Yeah. And so that's why it hit me so hard. And I was like, yeah, she's alive. I hope they get her. And she dies in the end. It's so fucking sad. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, he even realizes because when he pulls the two kids out, she has uh what is she? It's like a rock or like it's a shard of. Oh, yeah. So she clearly died trying to protect this kid mm-hmm. and he gets to that's like his last and look at her. And, when they thought she was dead, they said, you brought us all together. Mm-hmm. And when she actually died, she did bring she them did. all together. They all came together to fight and kill this monster. Yeah. And it also uh, the, the aunt was finally able to get over her. Uh, her freezing problem with the archery. She yeah. shot it at the perfect time. I wish she had a little bit more to do. Sure, yeah. Because she has that attribute of being like slow with the arrow and then the other characters label her as slow. Mm-hmm. Again, She's hilarious timid, scene. Yeah. yeah, very timid. But like she also gets knocked out for a while during the second half. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love when she, it's revealed that she was sleeping in the bridge like in a steel girder. Yeah. That was so cool. I was the like, oh, I want to go. of her I climbing on the like walkleys on the very red bridge yeah it's cool yeah yeah exactly um but yeah and then she also you know by dying the daughter also brings together this new family because yeah Yeah. he takes in this kid and again that's when at the end i noticed that it's this is like the first real food you see and like it's the first real like meal i guess yeah because even in the hospital he's cracking open that canned calamari which looks disgusting that was was the other thing i wanted to point out something that i i caught this time around that i think is such a funny visual joke is like you have he opens up that nasty it's like the can of yeah i think octopus i'm not sure what it is but I love that the the stores and stuff are like these aluminum trailers, kind of. And there's a part where the family's all like sleeping in the store and the monster comes and attacks the store. And it's flipped on its side and it's like just a funny visual joke. Yeah. I, I like that a lot. Nice. Just eating canned people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Great movie. Yeah, this movie rules. I don't even care if it's like... Meant like barely horror. Yeah, enough. That's so many people requested it, so I feel like it's a consensus that it's horror. It's, and it's I, a I'll monster movie it. at least. Oh, and yeah. monster movies are their own realm of horror. Yeah, aka Jurassic Park. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, but yeah, lots of people requesting this. So yeah, but then again, like people request for me Parasite, and that one, I'm like, I don't. I'm think sorry, that horror. one just feels a li- just a couple steps further from the genre. Yeah. I know that during a good 10 or 15 minutes near the end it gets horrific yeah but like it just feels so much more like a a i don't know it's drama. It's, its own thing yeah you just don't have to be genres but it just doesn't feel horror to me yeah. but snowpiercer a little closer it's more yeah, sci-fi snowpiercer i because we covered the platform so i think snowpiercer i would be same. Yeah. Realm is the platform. They're very Social similar, commentary, yeah. sci fi kind like of. Gory. <laughs> gory, yeah. All right. That's that for this week. Cool. And we'll do something else next week. Yep. And then in a few episodes, uh, this... we'll be somewhere else. Yeah. We're about 30 days, maybe. Yeah. About moving. a month. We're staying. I mean, we're still in the same city yeah. when I move, but like, you know. This will look different. Yeah. Kill counts will look different. It'll be weird. Get ready. In the meantime, you can follow Dead Meat on social media at Dead Meat James on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Carebeck, C A R E B E C C, on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want merch, deadmeatstore.com. Yeah. Good merch stuff there. You can also email deadmeatpod at gmail.com. And until next week, I'm James. <laughs> I'm Chelsea. This has been the Dead Meat Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>